Hey, grab your message notes. Let's dive in. Brand new series called Scandalous. Uh, and uh, if you are new with us, great to start at the beginning of a series with a note sheet. Uh, you can fill that out. We actually have binders. Hold up your binder if you got one. Where's all my binder people? That's right. You can collect these and use them. They're free at guest services. And we dive into the text today. Love for you to do that. Uh, this new series uh, we're looking at, Jesus may have been the most scandalous man to ever walk the face of the earth. In fact, especially at least in religious circles, uh, that uh, uh, we know that Jesus probably was the most scandalous person in religious circles. Let me say it like this. His methods were questionable. His company was speculative. He became enemies with those in power, and he became friends to those who were stuck in sin. And what I want to do is most of the time we think of scandals as somebody in public view, somebody out there. But what we're going to do over the next six weeks is we're going to look for a, the characters in Jesus' lives and try to find us. Because in the story with Jesus and characters, and he goes through, you're not Jesus, we're the ones in need, hence the name Scandal us, scandal us. And to start out, we're going to start with a character from Luke 19. If you got your Bibles, Luke 19. We're going to start the character with the character Zacchaeus. Come on, somebody. You get it? Scandal us, Zacchaeus. All right. Every week's going to end with an us. But anyway, Zacchaeus. What do you know about Zacchaeus? He was a what? Come on, church people. He was a what? A wee little man. Come on. Where's all my Sunday school people? How many of you got had a star chart? Got your star for attendance? Got your star for your memory verse? Got your star? star? You're like a five-star general up in there, Keith. Like, ah, oh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Now, how many of you didn't go to Sunday school? Raise your hand. If you didn't go to Sunday school, hey, cool. I like them. I don't have to fix y'all. Everybody else that don't want to raise your hand, I got to fix y'all, all right? Because here's the deal. Uh, we tend, we cannot, we cannot sanitize scandalous. Zacchaeus was not a wee little man. The text is going to tell us that Zacchaeus was a wicked little man. He was wicked. He was a chief tax collector is what the text says. He is a chief tax collector at a city called Jericho. And I got to kind of get you out of the song. And he climbed a tree for the Lord. He wanted to get out of that. Get out. No, no. He was the chief tax collector in Jericho. Jericho was the Beverly Hills of the eastern uh, part of the Roman Empire. He was, he, was, he was a tax chief, chief tax collector in a wealthy taxation center like Miami or like, like Palm Beach or like Manhattan. This dude was a baller. He had it all. He was the chief, chief tax collector. And what Rome would do is when Rome would come in and take over, they would hire locals who knew the people, who knew the geography to collect taxes on their behalf. And tax collectors were known to be despised and cheaters and scum of the earth. And I don't mean theoretically, I mean literally. In fact, in the Jewish law, there's a Jewish law called the Mishnah. It is, it is, it is, that's a Hebrew word. It was basically a doctrinal system. So the Mishnah comes out of this document we know of as the Talmud. If you're like, oh, I don't understand. Let, let me just read what Jewish people wrote about tax collectors. They said that tax collectors were so loath, loathsome, they were not even to be considered human. And they said this, it is not a sin to lie to a tax collector because they are beneath animals, and lying to an animal is not a sin. That's your Hebrew heritage moment of the month right there, all right? Oh, man. Can I tell you Zacchaeus is a great villain? Oh, Zacchaeus is a great villain. Zac Zacchaeus is like Tom Brady when he played for the Patriots. He's just somebody you love to hate. Zac uh, Zacchaeus is like Nick Saban if you're not an Alabama fan. You just, you just love to hate on old Nick. You love it. That's all right. His rings keep him company at night. Ah, oh, he's a great villain. Uh, Zacchaeus is like Kim Kardashian and cats. They're just easy to hate. Just easy to hate. He's a great villain, so let's go to our text of Luke chapter 19. We'll pick it up in verse number one. Here's what it says. Jesus entered Jericho, wealthy taxation center, and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, 
But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot and looked where he looked up and said to him, he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to say he's going to be the guest of a sinner, a despised, loathsome tax collector. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. And because this man, be, uh, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Come on, can you say amen for the Word of God? I want to use for a title for our time together, The Day That Changed Everything. The day everything changed. That was that day for Zacchaeus. I was thinking back through my life. There was days that changed everything. I remember the day I got my driver's license. Man, it changed everything because I, I was the youngest of three boys. So I was the baby and the favorite. Come on, we're all the youngest in the room, youngest. How many of you are oldest? Oldest, you're the oldest. Yeah, y'all bitter people, bitter. Yeah, you bitter at your mom and your grandma. Yeah, they loved us more and we're, and we're okay with it. All right, we're okay with it. I remember my brothers had to cart me around everywhere. I mean, I, they were taking me to soccer practice and this thing and this high school thing. But I, I mean, it, I didn't wear a kilt or anything, but it felt like a Braveheart moment when I got my, come on, like, like when I had my face painted like freedom, you know, I had one of them. Oh, it changed everything. I grew up in the, I grew up in the 90s. I was, a, I was a kid in the 80s, high school in the 90s. I remember the day that we got Wi-Fi. Now, most, some of you in the room are like, you don't know life without Wi-Fi. You're like, you think that the internet has always been, but there was a thing in the prehistoric era called dial-up. Come on, how many of you know some dial-up? That's right. And then your dad would pick up the phone while you was on the dial-up, and it would kick you off. Come on, how many of you feel my pain? Dude, I remember we got Wi-Fi out in the country. I thought, there is a man, I thought Jesus was going to come back. That Wi-Fi was the mark of the beast. Come on, somebody. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember the, one of the ones that really stood out to me was the day I got married. Day I got married because things began to change. I, I remember I had an apartment with another youth pastor. I was a youth pastor when I married my wife Avery, and uh, I, I remember like when 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 I when I was by myself, I was a single dude. Like I only had two pillows on my bed, and I only needed one. But Grandma bought me two because you gotta have two laid up there. Uh, now that I got married, I got thirty-seven pillows on my bed. Uh, now here's the thing about the thirty-seven pillows is is we, by we, I mean me, because I make up the bed and put the pillows up. We take these pillows, all these pillows, we got all these pillows. We, many me, take the pillows from the bed and we stack them on the floor at night only to make the bed in the morning, put the pillows back on the bed, close the door because we don't nobody see the room. I don't understand. Pillows. When I was a single dude, I had one bar of soap and a bottle of shampoo because, yes, I did have hair and when I was single. How many dudes know what I'm talking about? All right, now I got married. My shower looks like an owl at Target. I got shampoo, shiner, glazer, liquid nail. We got it all. I don't know what it is, but we got it. Now, here's the deal. I still only have one little spot in the shower. Come on, man. And I got one bar of soap, and even though I got no hair, I still got a little bit of shampoo. And here's the deal. You would think with all that stuff stacked over there, if you ran out of shampoo, you could borrow her shampoo, but you would be wrong. Oh, you'd be wrong. The other day, I, a couple weeks ago, I ran out of shampoo. I reached up there. She gets these, these natural bar things, y'all you know what I'm talking about? You know, because we don't, you know, she won't die with aluminum or something. So we got, got a natural. I reached up there and got a natural bar of soap that she had on her side. I washed it. And she came out there with the bar a little bit later. She said, did you use this? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. She said, that's natural bar shampoo, and it's not for you. And what am I supposed to do? Take my shampoo, unscrew the top, put, the, put it up there in the water, and shake it up. Like, come on, man. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Everything changed, man. That was, that was Zacchaeus' day. Everything changed. And I think so many times we come to church and we want this change, and we say things like, well, you know, if God wants me to change, you know, he's going to have to hit me over the head. <laughs> like change is all on God. Well, God might not hit you over the head. God might need you to climb a tree. If you want change to come to your life, 
And here's what I want for you. Like, I want everybody in the room, everybody watching online, I want you to experience a Zacchaeus moment, an everything change moment, an anchor point change moment, a moment that marks you. But here's what I figured out. You have a part to play in God's story, and if you want what Zacchaeus got in action is not an option. Come on and say amen. Because here's the tension. The tension in many of us want a Zacchaeus story without Zacchaeus surrender. Many of us want a Zacchaeus story without Zacchaeus action. But I figured out God can't answer prayers you won't pray. God can't bless a budget you won't make. Uh, God can't apply scripture to your life that you cannot read, uh, that you will not read. And I figured out many of us have a desire to change, but we refuse to act. You got to get today. I came to kind of kind of jar you out of your complacency because I've learned that deliverance starts with a decision. See, deliverance from your old life to your new life in Christ starts with a decision. Deliverance from skeptical to faithful starts with a decision. Deliverance from from worrying to trusting starts with a decision. Deliverance from where you are to where God desires for you to be, it'll start with a decision. Many of us, many of us, we're not held back by the devil. I think we're held back by our lack of decision. So here's the deal. I want to I want to kind of give you three decisions that may disrupt your life. But if you want a Zacchaeus story, it's going to disrupt your life. The first one is this number one. Number one, jot it down. You got to learn to make your way to Jesus. You got to learn to make your way to Jesus. Zac- Zacchaeus was successful by any worldly standard. I mean, we're used to seeing texts where Jesus reaches out to the poor and the marginalized and the destitute. That wasn't Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a baller. Shot caller, brawler, dipping into bins with a spall. Anyway, sorry. Sorry, I went old school there for a minute. I went old school there. Uh, Zacchaeus is not that guy. Zacchaeus is the guy you see on Instagram and you wonder, does he ever work? Y'all got people like this? Like they're always on vacation? And you're like, how do they afford it? And then they got two cars in the boat in the driveway? Yeah, I had the same question. Because, in fact, I, I, I started thinking, like, if we could, if we could peer in to first century Instagram, what would Zacchaeus post? Go and show my first, my first one. Here, Zacchaeus would, would post stuff like this. So he would, the chief tax guy. That would be his. That would be his Instagram handle. And he would say stuff like this: "I like my cars the same color as what I used to buy them, green like money." Come on, somebody, all right. Hashtag new chariot. Hashtag Lambo. Like this would be Zacchaeus's. House. He's not some poor, pitiful beggar. He is wealthy. He he would be the guy that 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 vacations by seasons. You ever you ever you ever known somebody like we summer in Aspen? You do what? You do you summer somewhere? That, yeah, we just vacation by season. Oh, we're gonna spend the winter in the Bahamas. <laughs> All right, here here's going to show my another. here chief tax guy. Uh, he's he's checking in at Engedi, which is on the Red Sea, and he would say stuff like this: Weekend getaway. For the seventh weekend in a row, hashtag vacation, hashtag collections and vacation. Thanks a lot, people. All right, so this is this guy. This will be his. Go and show my last one. This is my last one. I love this one. That's this one. Oh, yeah. By the way, thanks, peasants. Yes, that's Zacchaeus. That's who he is. He is the one in charge. And here's what I want to tell you. In Zacchaeus' world, everything looks good on the outside, but obviously something is missing and broken on the inside. And he's wondering, maybe, 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 maybe this man from Galilee, maybe there's more to it. Maybe the rumors are true. Maybe he does heal blinded eyes. Maybe he does redeem purposes. Maybe he does direct lives. Maybe there's something more to this life that I'm missing. And here's what it says in Luke 19, verse 3, and we read the underlined words together so you can read them with me. He said, he, say it with me, wanted, he wanted to see Jesus. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he what? He ran and he climbed a tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. I think, I can't prove it, but I think Zacchaeus knew that there was more to life than the life that he was currently living. See, Zacchaeus had money, but he didn't have meaning. Zacchaeus had power, but he didn't have peace. 
Zac- Zacchaeus had success, but he didn't have salvation. And I think he's thinking maybe there's more to this teacher from, Zac- from, from, from Galilee. And I think we should look into this text and see that Zacchaeus is us. You're not Jesus looking for the sinner. You are the sinner. We are the one. We are Zacchaeus. We are the one in need. We are the one, because everybody in this room has been like Zacchaeus. We have all looked to worldly things to provide what only Jesus can fulfill. Every single one of us has put something in the place of God, and there's been people that would chase material things, thinking if I get the right house or the right car, somehow I'm going to achieve some level of status, because I didn't have anything growing up, so I'm going to work really hard to have more than I ever had, only to find out disappointment in the end. Some of us do in relationships, and it, it, it wasn't money for you. It was relationships, so, so you jump from person to person. Trying, they'll fulfill me. They'll fulfill me. I'll have meaning here, and I can't be by myself because I'm by myself, then I feel lonely, and I feel less than, and I feel not approved of. And so you go from relationship to relationship, from person to person, trying to find the thing that only Jesus can fulfill in you. We're all Zacchaeus. We do it with bitterness. We, we do it with substances. We do it with hobbies, trying to stuff and fill the hole that is in your own soul. We are all Zacchaeus, and here's the deal. If that's you, I just want to encourage you. You might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. See, we say things like, God, move in my life. Well, if you want God to move in your life, you might have to climb a tree and get to Zacchaeus. God, we want breakthrough. If you want breakthrough, you might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. In fact, I found out if you want God to free you from selfishness, you might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. If you want God to change your toxic thoughts, you might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. If you want God to heal the bitterness on the inside of you, you might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. You want God to free you from the hatred in your soul, the people you don't seem to be able to feel. You might have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. You got to get to him. You got to get to him. Why? Because breakthrough begins when indifference ends. Breakthrough begins when indifference ends. And Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. That's the professional way to say he's short. And here's the deal. We don't make fun of short people in this church. That's right, because your, your pastor is one. That's right. Mm-hmm. I'll go Old Testament on you. I'll go, I'll go Elijah on you, man. I'll, you, they made, some kids made fun of a balding prophet. He called out bears and mauled them to death. Get some of that. So if there's bears in the parking lot, get you some. All right, get you some of that. Zacchaeus, was, his view was skewed, but, but it didn't stop him. So, so it's not a song. He kind of... He was, it was practical and persistent. Like he didn't climb a tree because he wanted to. He climbed a tree because it was practical and persistent. Sometimes I think we over-spiritualize this thing. Sometimes I think we, uh, we're, we're looking for like, God, you're going to have to shine a light from heaven. I'm like, no, you're going to have to climb a tree and get to Jesus. You're going to have to be practical about this thing. You're going to have to position yourself. In, the thing. in fact, I jotted it down like this. Sometimes the level at which we experience God is related to our level of persistence. Sometimes we don't get the breakthrough in our life we really want because we have not been persistent enough to pursue God. We, we, in fact, we give up too quickly. We quit too often before God can ever do it in our life. And I found out that sometimes it is the persistence in our life that will open the door to the miraculous in our life. And if you are not willing to be persistent, I trust me, you will not find out that he is the God that is more than enough. It's our persistence to open the door. And a lot of people are like, wow, yeah, yeah this is some, someday. Oh, someday, some, someday, I'm gonna, man, I'm gonna, mm, someday I'm going to join that church. Some of y'all have been coming eight, eight months, ain't, ain't even been to grow plan. Some, someday you know, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to invest in my marriage someday. I'm going to invest in my family someday. I'm going I'm I'm to be in my kids. I, right now I've got to make this money. I've got to get this bag. I've got to take care of this so they can do all the things they want to do. Can I tell you they need you more than all the things that you want them to do? Someday, someday. Here's why we love someday. Someday takes the pressure off today. But I found out before Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house, I think Zacchaeus said in his heart, today I'm getting to Jesus. See, life is way too short to wait for someday. 
Don't let apathy hold your future hostage. Maybe your day is today. Maybe your day, don't, hey, don't let life lull you into complacency because I came to tell you how it is is not how it has to be. When Jesus is present, anything is possible. When Jesus is present, even the worst of the worst can be saved. When Jesus is present, peace is possible. When Jesus is present, breakthrough is possible. When Jesus is present, healing is possible. When Jesus is present, hope is possible. When Jesus is present, anything can happen. But you've got to position yourself to get Jesus. Number two, number two, jot it down. Jesus calls and we respond. So respond when Jesus calls. And this is what I want my kids to do when I give them an instruction. Come on, parents of young kids. Just a little sign of life, any sign at all. I don't know, man. I don't know if I, I love my kids and cars, cars in this one, this service, but I can give my kids instructions, and it like, it's like they don't breathe. It's, it's, it's like one of those nature episodes where the, where the hunter stalking his prey, and the prey feels like it's been identified, and they just... <laughs> and I want to be like, I can see you. And it tends to happen around this God-forsaken time in our house called bath time. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else feel my pain? All right, bath, bath time. And, and here's the deal. We, we, are, we are clean people in the forest. I want you to know your pastor's clean. We're clean people. We bathe, we bathe our kids. We tell our kids to bathe. We're clean. We do, he's 12. We've done it his whole life. Every night, 365 nights a year for 12 years, we've done bath time. You would think, though, when we tell him and Gra Car uh, Graham to get a bath, it's the first time they've ever been told how to do it. And, and I do. I feel like that, you know, like, you know, I'll come in there and say, hey, it's time to get a bath. And, you know, he, he, and most of the time I'll get this, five more minutes, five more minutes. I'm, I'm cool. I'm a five more minute guy. All right. My, my wife is not a five more minute girl. Not at all. You know, all right. She's like, no, now. She will bah, elbow off the top rope. All right. I'm like, cool. So I'll wait 10 minutes because I'm generous. I'm generous. All right. I like being generous. Right, your pastor's a generous person. I'll wait 10 minutes and then I'll come out there and I'll be like, hey, it's been 10 minutes. Time to go. Um, Time for a bath. And, and you would think it's like, you know, crikey, right there's an American house hippo, and I'm going to sneak up on him. And, you know, you know, it's like all this stuff. And, and, and I try the calm voice. I try, let's get a bath. Let's get a bath. Like I, I sing to you, my darling. I try that. And it's not until I have to yell at my children like they are from Al-Qaeda that I have... I say, I got a bath. Well, you have you yelling at us. Cause you're terrorists. That's why you're terrorists. <laughs> you didn't respond the first 37 times. I said, get a bath. <laughs> come on, come on, my parents. Say amen. amen. Woo. Nice Just respond. I was thinking about this text this week and. I was thinking, man, I wonder how many of us are stuck in our spiritual lives because he called and we didn't respond. I wonder how many times we thought it was the church or the pastor, but really it was our delayed obedience that was disobedient. See, what you don't know is every time you say no to God, it desensitizes your heart to hear His voice. See, and I think that's what happens in our lives. Because we come to church and you feel the call of God. You feel the pull of God. You feel it in your soul. You're like, no, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. But every no, you're like, I'll do it next week. And that's the problem with American Christianity. We think we can come to God. It's always going to be available. It's always going to be available. The problem is you, some of us have said no to God so long. You used to feel him every time you walked in the door, but you've been coming for the last three weeks, and you're wondering why you don't feel anymore. It's because your heart's gotten hard. And I've been there. I was there 14 years ago where I couldn't feel him. And it's miserable, Pastor Matt. 
to be at a place that you desire to feel the presence of God again, to, to feel him on the inside, to feel the pull, the, to hear the voice, and you can't no matter how much you pray because your heart has become so hardened to his voice and to his call. So when he calls, you must respond. And Zacchaeus, that's, that's what amazes me about Zacchaeus. Look at, look at the text. Look at the text. Jesus stops. He reaches the spot. He looks up, and he says to him, Zacchaeus. I think it's amazing. He knows, he knows the poorest man in town, blind Bartimaeus in, in Luke 18, blind Bartimaeus, beggar on the road, but he knows the wealthy. He, know, he knows everybody. He says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must. I have to stay at your house. So Zacchaeus, what do he do? He come down at, say it with me, at once. And welcome him what? Gladly. No, no, no pro-con list. No, hey, let me get ready. No, I got some stuff to do. No, I'm, I'm too young to live for Jesus now. No, no, he came and he got to Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is still calling. He is still calling people from captivity to victory. He is still calling people out of spiritual apathy into spiritual maturity. He is still calling Daniels that will stand on their campus as a student and be a godly influence in a godless culture. He is still calling disciples from normal to supernatural. He is still calling. The question is, will you respond? Now, here's the deal. Here's what I had to figure out. It's the calling cost. I love preaching about calling. But too many times I preached about calling and I didn't preach about cost. There's a cost to this thing. You want to follow Jesus with everything you have, it's going to cost you some comfort. In fact, you will have to walk out of comfort to walk into calling. It's going to cost you some approval. Not everybody's going to be down with who you are. Not everybody's going to be, not everybody's going to be, everybody, hey, you've changed. Yeah, I've changed. For the better, on purpose. you got to respond when he calls, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you some ego. Jesus may put you on donkey duty. Read on in Luke. Read on in Luke. There's two disciples, two nameless disciples. Now, I can't prove that it was Peter and John, but I think he needed Peter and John. Two disciples, two disciples. Right before the cross, he calls two disciples together and says, hey, I got, I got an important mess. I got an important task for you. And two disciples are like, we ready, Jesus. We're going to do this. We're going to overthrow Rome because they still don't understand the cross. So they still don't know all this stuff. We got you back, Jesus. What you need to do? All right, I need you to go to Jerusalem. All right, and I need you to get me an Uber. All right. You need to say, what? Yeah, they go, they're going to be a man with a coat tied up, a donkey tied up there. You tell him the Lord needs an Uber to get, to get into town. You, we, Jesus, we fed 5,000 people. We, I walked on water with you. you want, here's the deal. You want to follow Jesus? Are you willing to do some donkey duty? We've had people around here say, so I, I own my own business. I ain't taking out the trash around here. Okay. Hey, let me tell you something. If you're too big to serve, then you're probably too small to be used greatly by God. You got to respond when Jesus calls. In fact, he says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, follow me. It's calling. Third one is this, we're done. Jesus radically changes us. Zacchaeus is changed. His life was never the same. And I think so many people, I've heard it as a pastor, a pastor life, it was hard to change. It's hard when you've been one way all your whole life. It's hard. I get it, Eeyore. But if you play the victim, you'll stay the victim. The question is, do you want to get to Jesus. I really think the reason change is hard is because you can't hold on to your old life and have the one that Jesus offers too. Just going to wait. All right. And wrong all service. Going to ring right there. Why? Because we're just trying to get our attention off what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. 
Zacchaeus came to the realization that the life Jesus would give him would be greater than anything he left behind. Watch what happens. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, to the Lord. What did he say? Look, say it with me. Lord. He was a tax collector. He would have to take a pinch of salt, throw it in an incense, and he would every day on his way to work, Jesus, uh, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. We don't understand the paradigm shift when he says, Caesar's not my Lord anymore. Money's not my Lord anymore. I wonder if today there'll be people who say, you know what, work's not my Lord anymore. Alcohol's not my Lord anymore. Anger's not my Lord anymore. Anxiety is not my Lord anymore. Jesus, you are my Lord. And look what he says, here and now. We didn't, he didn't wait. He didn't try to figure it out. Here and what? Here and now. I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I cheated anybody, anything, I'll pay them back four times. He was only responsible to pay them back 20%, but he's paying them back four times. And Jesus says, today, what? Salvation has come to this house because this man too is a what? Son. From sinner to son. From despised to son. From wicked to son. And the mark was the change that happened. It disrupted his life. Let me tell you, you cannot have a Zacchaeus story without the Holy Spirit disrupting some things in your life. Will you stand with me all over this room? Jesus, help us. Come on, bow your head. I wonder if you met a Savior, but you have yet to declare Him as Lord. It's becoming harder and harder for me as a pastor to see Jesus through the lens of Scripture and understand how we can be casual about Christianity. I'm having harder and harder for me to see people who say they have been embraced and forgiven by the love of God and are the meanest people on Facebook. It's becoming harder and harder for me to see people who say that I'll, I'll love Him with everything I have. But we attend church once every four weeks. You want a Zacchaeus moment, it'll have to be disruptive. And Jesus is calling some of us. Nobody looking around me in our prayer team. If you're here today and you're living life far from God, didn't even plan on salvation, but you know the thing that is separating you is your sin. You're Zacchaeus. Oh, you look good on the outside, but you're separated on the inside. You're empty on the inside, broken on the inside. And you don't even know right now if you met eternity today where you would spend it. And if that's you, I'm not going to pinpoint you out. I just need to know who you are. So I just want you to shoot your hand in the air and say, you know what? I need to come home to Christ. I need the loving and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Get them up. Get them up. Get them up. I need Jesus. Yes, sir. Here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. In the back over here. Make sure I see your hand real quick. Yes, sir. You can put it down. Yes, ma'am. You can put it down. Yeah, amen. Yes, in the back. I got you. You can put it down. Yes. I need Jesus. If that's you, I just want to give you an opportunity right there to see you say, Lord, I need you. You don't have to repeat after me, but you can say something like this in your heart. Forgive me for being a sinner. I need a Savior. You are coming by, and I want to meet you. I want you to redeem my future. I want you to save me from my sin, and I want you to secure my eternity with you. 